Hey, how's it going? Uh, yeah, I'm in my car reading comics in uh, my favorite comic reading spot out here in the uh, Arcata Eureka area. I'm not going to tell you exactly where I'm at because this is my spot that I like to go to to read comics and uh, chill out a little bit. So um, today let's talk about Doomsday Clock number 10. So this is the series that I've been hate reading and not enjoying so much, just because I'm more or less confused about it and trying to understand what's going on. But I think this issue may have turned me around because I thought it was pretty darn good. Um, first of all, the entire series, each issue, um, it's supposed to be bi-monthly, by the way, but it's been super late. This is like, I think it started a year and a half ago or two years ago. I'm not even sure. Um. So it's been behind schedule, but each issue is beautiful. It's just a beautiful artifact. I love the feel of a single issue comic in my hand. And this one, you know, every single page is designed, right? There's no ads, no garish uh, video game or Gogurt ads or whatever. Uh, so every single page is, um, you know, being displayed the way it's meant to. And it's got nice backup features and stuff that we'll talk about in a second. But basically, this story is ver is a turning point for the entire... DC universe, not just the DC universe, but the DC multiverse, the metaverse, um, as we learn about in this issue. So essentially what's revealed in this issue is that Dr. Manhattan is sort of traveling through time and in the, in the DC universe. And what he's noticing is that things are changing. Right. If you go back to like 1938, well, then, you know, Superman in Action Comics number one through this car. Right. So uh, it, it, that, that was where Superman began. But, you know, later on in in throughout the history of DC Comics, that's sort of changed. Right. It's been retconned. In case you don't know what that means, that means retroactive continuity. That means they sort of like. Uh, go back and change things that we th about the character that we used to know about the character and make them different, right? And um, this one is no different. They're showing the Justice Society of America, uh, and which did not have Superman in it, and and but it keeps going back in time and things change. So that was the Golden Age Superman, but now they go to 1956. Right, and 1956 uh, is like the dawn of the Silver Age, and so the they they redid Superman's origins again back then and retconned it a little bit, and to show uh, more with a more modern sort of 50s sensibility because that made just more sense than uh, those who'd been reading since 1938, where Superman was kind of a way different kind of a thing. Um, anyway, uh, then we move forward into. Uh, other versions of Superman, like uh, w again in 1986, John Byrne after the f after the crisis relaunched Superman. So it was like Superman in the more modern DC universe did not appear until 1986, compared to when in in the other Earth Two universes where he had begun in 1938 and been there for World War II and everything else. They retconned it, right? And that's sort of happened many times. Uh, here we see Superman uh, trying to join the Legion of Superheroes, or Superboy, rather, uh, in the 30th century. And then we see some other stuff. We see John, uh, Dr. Manhattan, kind of figuring out that if he can go through time and, and, and alter things in this universe, it, it adapts, so again, we see different, more modern versions of Superman and how he's been retconned, whether it's a movie version or Grant Morrison's New 52, uh, first New 52 version, or the really ugly looking Jim Lee designed costume version, uh, you know, all the way up through the, the, the end of that universe and Flashpoint and where, where sort of Dr. Manhattan first got introduced to the DCU. And John does some foreshadowing and he sees into the future where he's going to fight Superman and either 
uh, either he destroys, Superman destroys John, or John destroys the metaverse, which is what he's dubbed this universe. So essentially, uh, and I'm not going to show the rest of this, I'm not going to spoil the issue per se, because it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's got, um, it's better than I thought. But what's really the most interesting thing to me is that clearly uh, Dr. Manhattan is being written as a metaphor for, uh, for Jeff Johns, the writer himself, right? I wanted to point this out when, when, when he starts talking about, uh, you know, without us, uh, I understand him better. I relate to him more. It's five years ago, and I feel the power of changing Superman. It is intoxicating. So <clears throat> this was the Grant Morrison New 52 relaunch, which was all shepherded by, by Johns. I have altered the metaverse, and in turn, the multiverse. One year ago, the metaverse became aware of my hubris. That's, that's like when Dr. Manhattan entered the DCU, right? So clearly, Johns is writing... Uh, Dr. Manhattan has a metaphor for himself and the creative power uh, that he holds in the DC universe. But what's pretty cool and I like is the idea that all this old continuity, all these old stories written by so many people that really are the foundation of what became Superman and the DC universe, um, we don't want to just throw those away, right? We Those comics are still great. Those stories are still excellent. So... I think what John is trying to do here is say that um, those things, we're not discarding them. We may be rewriting the universe on a yearly basis and rebooting and relaunching all the time, but that's what the DC universe is. It's not a universe in the multiverse. It's a metaverse, right? The multiverse reacts to the metaverse. And that's his contention anyway. And that... And that the, the, the DC Universe will be ever-changing, but Superman is always at the core of what it's all about. Like, Superman is what started it all, the idea of the superheroes and this hopeful universe. And now, the hopeful universe, uh, you know, got sort of corrupted by, uh, after the dark era of comics, some say was ushered in by the Watchmen. So, and, and, you know, so John brings us back to the Watchmen and he says, you know, I allowed Adrian to walk free. I'm a being of inaction, which is sort of what John was. He was like a God with the feet of clay. He's on a collision, but now I'm on a collision course with a man of action to this universe of hope. I've become the villain. Nice ending, Right. Every action has its pleasures and its price, Socrates. Um, so clearly it's a pivoting point. We're realizing John is uh, kind of the villain of this story per se, and, and that, uh, or at least that's how he is perceived. Um, there's some nice backup material here in the back. Uh, that's a, a script that one of the actors in the issue is, is portraying, but there are also little hints in here about... Uh, I think it's sort of a metaphor, just like uh, the, the pirate story in Watchmen. It's a story within a story that's a metaphor for the story itself. And uh, I'll just say, point out this one bit of dialogue here. Nathaniel Dusk. I was so focused on what made the two men different. I didn't see the obvious. It was what they have in common that mattered. I think this is a clue. I think this is a hint. I think this is how the story is going to resolve. I don't think John... Uh, Ma Dr. Manhattan is going to become the new ultra supervillain of the uh, DC universe. I think it's going to be more complicated than that. I think it's going to be maybe an excuse to rewrite continuity again, yet again in the DC universe. It's been done several times so recently, so many reboots. But I think the idea is that reboots are the new normal and that's what we should be used to. New creative teams taking risks and trying new things with even if it's with old characters. Right? So, uh, hey, you know, if you like this video, you might like some of my other videos. So try checking them out. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. 
and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.